Good evening, everybody. Thank you so much for joining us in Mind the Bleep for our OBS and Gaini, um webinar this evening. So Will Wilson Thika is an OBS and Gaini ST6, and he'll be telling us all about um, his career and answering some questions for us. So Will, I'm just going to go straight to you. Feel free to get started. That's fantastic. Thanks very much, Sarah. Thanks, everyone. Good evening. Um, Firstly, thank you everyone for giving up your time and energy on a Monday evening to come and sit and listen to me waffle on um, about PPH. Um, it is always amazing when people give up their free time to listen to voluntary lectures. Um, so all credit to you. Um, thank you very much to Syrah and the team at Mind the Bleep for asking me to come and have a natter to you about this. As she said, uh, my name is Will. Um, I'm an ST6 trainee in the Northwest, uh, working with it on St. Gainey. Um, a little bit more about me. Um, so under the old system, I'm now a senior registrar, um, ancient in my time, um, currently undertaking uh, the mandatory advanced labor ward ATSM and also the benign gynae abdominal surgery uh, ATSM. Proud dad of two. This is my youngest, Humphrey, who's currently weaning and covered in everything that he can get his hands on. Um, we have an older daughter Francesca who is three who is probably running around the house and may well crash in on this teaching at any stage so fair warning for all of you um I love teaching I've always enjoyed teaching I've always benefited from very good teachers and mentors and I think one of the most important things about medicine <clears throat> is the ability to teach and train the generation that is following behind you because it's a quality of life thing when you become the more senior people managing labor ward you want to have uh, junior colleagues who you know that you can rely on in an emergency. Um, I'm currently doing a, a postgraduate certificate in medical education by Edge Hill University. I am not an academic. This will not be a highbrow lecture. I am definitely a clinician. I do not enjoy uh, writing essays. I do not enjoy research. That is not me. Um, but I do love teaching. Teaching via a screen is not my ideal. I much prefer teaching in person. I much prefer you know, scribbling on whiteboards, moving around, trying to engage people on a personal level. Um, so do forgive me if it comes across a bit stale. Um, <clears throat> I came to Obs and Gainey by a slightly roundabout route. So uh, my foundation training portfolio and CV was all geared towards um, trauma and orthopedics. I applied for a core surgical training job. I crashed and burned on the interview. Um, but my last rotation in foundation was an obs and gynae I thought hey this is quite fun you know this is surgical this is medical um so I did a year-long clinical research fellowship in obs and gynae in in trauma orthopedics and during that time realized I didn't actually like trauma orthopedics as much as I thought applied for obs and gynae training um and haven't looked back once it's a fantastic specialty and as we will uh, talk about in the management of PPH I always say to my junior colleagues, I would say a good 80 to 90% of OBS and gynae is a communication-based uh, uh, specialty. It's one where it doesn't matter whether you are the best person in the world at performing a C-section or a real dab hand with a pair of forceps. If you cannot adequately, adequately communicate with the, the patient in front of you, uh, their birth partner, the members of the multidisciplinary team, you may as well not bother because it is such a uh, nuanced uh, career for uh, communication skills, as is all medicine, but in the acute setting of labour ward, perhaps more so. So during this session, um, I'll be mindful of time because I want to leave some um, opportunity for questions later on. So we're going to talk about some of the definitions of PPH. We're going to talk about why PPH is important. We're going to talk about a bit of the pathophysiology, including everyone's favourite, a little bit of bonus embryology. Um, please, it's not going to be much because I hate embryology. Um, we're going to talk about risk factors for PPH. We're going to talk about the management. Uh, we'll cover uh, running through the major obstetric hemorrhage protocol, what that looks like. I've taken some examples from the unit I currently work within um, in terms of some of the documentation that we use uh, and we'll work through some case studies and then we will uh, hopefully have plenty of time for questions afterwards. Um, now, I finished nights uh, this, this, this morning, um, so I have actively managed PPH all weekend. However, if I do start to sleep and sit, uh, sl uh, slip into a deep sleep, someone just poke me on the chat. Okay, so the overarching summary of PPH management, right as a headline, 
from the get-go. If you are the first on call, SHO, junior grade, whatever you want to call yourself and whatever the current in vogue definition is, if you are the junior on call, if there is a PPH going on, all you need to do is walk into that room and have a look. Let's make sure the patient's got large bore IV access. And if they've already got one in, put another one in. If as you are progressing through your career in Ops and Gynia, if you are mad enough to enjoy it and you have become the, the second on call, the registrar, the middle grade, make sure your SHO has got some IV access in. Manage every patient as we're always taught to via an A, B, C, D, E approach. One of your first steps of management is bimanual compression, which we will cover in a short while. Ask for medications to be given and have a low threshold to take your patient to the operating theatre if you've got ongoing bleeding or what we call the major obstetric hemorrhage or MOH. OK, um, I always just say when I, when there's a PPH going on, I walk into the room, I say hello to the woman. I do buy manual compression. I start shouting at the midwives to give drugs. And it's just that simple. It's not that simple. But so if we're talking about definitions, all of the information that I'm going to be giving you is mainly pulled from the Royal College of Obstetricians and, uh, and, and Gynecologists Green Top Guidelines. And um, so we've got a Green Top Guideline, which is about prevention and management of postpartum hemorrhage. It was published in 2016 or was, was most recently updated in 2016. And they do review and, and update these guidelines, but the management of PPH doesn't really change. And this covers how we manage it in the UK, um, but the Royal College does kind of advise internationally as well. So talking about uh, postpartum hemorrhage, we divide it into primary and secondary. So primary postpartum hemorrhage is blood loss greater than 500 mils. The college say it's via the genital tract. However, you know, if you're having a cesarean section, for example, it's not going to be via the, the genital tract. But it's blood loss greater than 500 mils within the first 24 hours of birth. Um, it can then further be subdivided into a minor PPH, which is between 500 mils and 1,000 mils or a litre, um, or a major PPH, which is greater than 1,000 mils. And then major PPH is further subdivided into moderate or severe, depending on uh, your overall blood loss. But you're, it's becoming academic at that point. Once it's higher than 1,000 mils, your management doesn't really change. It's just what you're going to be doing for the poor lady. When you're talking about secondary postpartum hemorrhage, it's blood loss greater than 500 mils after 24 hours and up to six weeks postnatally. And after six weeks postnatally, it's bleeding, which is not defined as a postpartum hemorrhage. Um, the mass, vast majority of this talk is uh, all to do with uh, primary postpartum hemorrhage, but we will uh, briefly cover secondary postpartum man hemorrhage, the management of which is relatively simple. So why do we care? What's the point? You know, oh God, everyone bleeds, it's pregnancy. Um, but we um, have the Embrace Report, which is a, a national body that which collects maternity, um, mortality and morbidity um, in the UK. Um, it publishes a report which covers every triennium, uh, which is you know, a three year period. So the most recent Embrace Report, which was published in November 2021, focused on uh, the years 2017 to 2019. So unfortunately, in this country, women still die as a result of pregnancy and childbirth. Uh, and in that triennium, 191 women died during pregnancy and within six weeks uh, of birth. The maternal mortality ratio, which is essentially talking about the number of deaths related to live births and stillbirths after 24 completed weeks, is 8.79 per 100,000 maternities. Um, these, these are all numbers which, if you're not working obstetrics, don't really mean all that much to you. But, you know, we're always quite interested with the Embrace report. And, you know, they separate uh, deaths between uh, what we call direct deaths, which are um, causes directly related to being pregnant um, and indirect deaths, which are um, deaths which are exacerbated by the pregnant state. So things like cardiovascular problems or neurological problems such as epilepsy. So it's not caused by the pregnancy itself, but can be exacerbated by the pregnant state. But anyway, uh, in this country, hemorrhage is the second uh, highest cause of direct deaths. Um, it's the same as sepsis uh, and is only behind blood clots or VTE as a, as a cause of death. And it's one of those ones where you know, you know, the, the causes of direct death 
kind of uh, jockey for position depending on how well we're managing things. So it used to be that sepsis was a very uh, uh, higher uh, rate of mortality for women. We got much better at managing sepsis. Um, and then it was hemorrhage for a while and now it's VT and we just kind of try and manage the best we possibly can. So within the 2017 to 2019 triennium, 14 women in the UK died during, during, uh, due to hemorrhage. However, the, the UK is a, a, a Western country. It's got advanced, uh, access to, to good um, healthcare systems. I mean, your opinion on the NHS can differ. That's fine. Um, but the benefit is in this country that we don't think about the medications that we are uh, opening and using. We don't think about the cost behind it. We don't think about the cost of the IV access we're citing. Um, we just go for it. We manage the women as we need and we don't charge them. It's bloody marvellous. Um, that's not the case elsewhere in the world. Um, globally, over half a million die, half a million women a year die due to hemorrhage. That uh, numbers published from the Lancet in 2014. Um, I'm not sure what the numbers are now, um, and that is mainly in countries that don't have access to, um, you know, good healthcare or have don't have local healthcare or don't have advanced healthcare within you know a local area so places like sub-saharan africa and southern asia but even in the united states so places where there is great disparity in in, in poverty and wealth um you will get women dying from avoidable hemorrhage um, so that's just a little bit of the background this is the only slide that's going to involve embryology i promise so why do women bleed um, so part of the uh Physiological processes of a normal pregnancy involve, as you can see in this picture on the right hand side, we're looking at, at the bottom, you can see your placenta um, with your uh, placental villi. Um, and I don't know if you can see my cursor. I hope you can. Um, but what we yes, can we see can. here is, we can, Cyrus, can you see them? Can yep, see we them? can see your cursor. Super duper. So what we've got here is the blood supply to your uterus, which from the top is the ovarian artery which originates in the abdominal aorta from the bottom is the uterine artery which is a branch of the internal iliac the anastomose you know in the kind of what's called the uh, lateral spaces in the pelvic side wall and they give blood supply off into the uterus itself and then they form what's called these spiral arteries of the uterus and in the non pregnant state these are very tightly coiled um and you know have quite a narrow lumen um, but one of the normal processes of, um, of placental implantation is that you get this invasion of, uh, of trophoblastic material into the lumen of the spiral arteries, which causes them to dilate and slow their um, and, 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 and open up. And you get a much higher flow at a lower pressure, which is why you get perfusion of the placental bed throughout the maternal cardiac cycle and all this sort of stuff. Um, what it means is, is the blood flow to the uterus at term is about 700 mils a minute. So if you want to illustrate that to a patient or in your own mindset, just imagine, take a bottle of wine or your favorite beverage and just pour it down the sink, one of those a minute. And that's what you're trying to combat if a woman is actively bleeding. One of the natural things that happens to try and stop women to bleeding to, from bleeding to death is that following placental separation, you get a flood of maternal clotting factors, uh, which helps to reduce the risk of blood, blo blood clots post delivery. It's a very clever, natural response. Um, quite often you will see if you're performing uh, a vaginal delivery or if you're doing a cesarean section, for example, if you open the abdomen and you've got some small bleeding from uh, superficial skin vessels, if you leave those alone, by the time you finish your cesarean section, they've all clotted off. Um, and that is just part of physiological processes. But this can be disrupted by pathologies. Um, one of the things that can cause abnormal pathology related to the placenta itself is that in preeclampsia, you get abnormal trophoblastic invasion, um, which can cause alteration to the to the blood flow within the um, placental bed. Um, preeclampsia is a completely separate topic, which you can have a, a great in-depth conversation uh, and lecture on. We won't cover that today. Um, the other thing that can cause uh, blood loss is that we're really, really bad at estimating it. Quite often in obstetrics, 
it's just kind of a visual eyeball. You have a look and you go, mm, yeah, that blood loss looks to be about mm, 600 mils. But it can be concealed. So, you know, you can get blood loss which soaks into the sheet. It can run underneath the bed. It can run underneath the patient. You can kind of uh, have some user bias because you've done the delivery. You don't want it to be too high. Um, you know, you might think that, oh, there was a lot of light at delivery. So that's probably, you know, making it look a bit more than it is. Um, so quite often you can say, oh, that looks to be about 800 mils blood loss. And then they actually weigh all the swabs and the sheets and everything like that. And they turn around and they go, oh, well, that blood loss is 1800 mils. You go, oh, crumpets. Uh, that's not so great. So best practice, uh, and one of the things that the, the college guideline recommends is to um, either have drapes that will uh, catch all the all the blood loss that you have or to weigh all your swabs or have suction that you know you you, you count and when you're in the operating theater that's fine but when you are having say for example a, a nice calm midwifery led birth within your you know uh, within your birth centers or your obstetric units or a home birth you don't want to cover a woman in in lots of drapes you don't want to disrupt her birth experience so it can be very very difficult to to, to do so I don't know how many of you are currently working in obstetrics or, or, or where you're working, but in OBS and Gynae, we like big cannulas. Uh, and quite often, if people come to us from uh, you know, medical wards where they're dealing with geriatric patients with poor IV access, and they're used to kind of getting in a, a blue or a pink cannula if they very much can, can a kind of like, what are you doing with these greys and green cannulas? But the reason is, as we've said just before, the blood flow to the uterus at term is 700 mils a minute. If you have got a obstetric woman with a pink cannula in, one, the maximum you're gonna get through there is 67 mils per minute. So if that uterus is pouring out blood and you're only able to top her up at 67 mils a minute, you're not gonna be able to keep up. That's why we like to be able to resuscitate a woman with at least two, you know, one if you, if if nothing else but two wide bore IV access, um, greys if possible. They look like drain pipes and it's not nice for the ladies. But if you've got a woman who is needle phobic or declining IV access, this is the rationale. This is what we talk to them about in terms of why we need this big IV access. And you can probably push a slightly higher flow rate through a green cannula if you're using a pressure bag. Um, but yeah, if we see it, the midwives go mad, it makes me very upset. If in sometimes you get women brought in by ambulance crews with uh, you know one tiny little pink cannula in the antecubital fossa, yeah, you know, a, a pregnant woman at term has got such massive veins, antecubital fossa, you could probably put a bloody domestic drain pipe in. They're that big. Um, but anyway, so please, 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 anyone who's currently working in obstetrics or thinking about a career in obstetrics or has got a rotation coming up, get comfortable with big cannulas. Okay. Um, if we're going to look at a very basic um, cause of PPHs, uh, we separate out bleeding into the four T's. Not the four T's that you get in a cardiac arrest. So again, people coming in from medicine, do not think about tension pneumothoraces or anything like that. The things that we are interested in are tone, which is tone of the uterus, tissue, so that can be either retained placenta or it can be blood clots, um, trauma, so whether that be uh, iatrogenic trauma, so either a cesarean section that we've done, an episiotomy that we have created due to an instrumental delivery, or just a, uh, a perineum that's uh, suffered from significant trauma that might have um, significant varicosities, and then finally thrombin, which is actually coagulopathies. Um, and the vast majority of PPHs are all down to this, and correcting these is going to help you to manage PPHs. And the vast majority of PPHs, 90% of PPHs are related to tone uh, and poor uterine tone. So most of the time, as you'll see later on in this talk, as we talk about management of PPH, the most common focus is managing the uterine tone and sorting that out. And if you sort that out, the vast majority of the time, things get better. Um, I hope that Everything is making sense so far. I'm not seeing any questions in the chat at the moment. And um, if everyone's happy, I'm just gonna keep on going through. And if there is anything that you want me to circle back to, that's absolutely fine. Um, so can we predict PPH? And whilst you're reading this busy slide, I'm gonna have a slurp of tea. 
so there are some um, things with, within antenatal and intrapartum care that can help you to predict um, uh, a PPH. Um, the college guidelines will give you the odds ratios of, 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 of statistically how much higher some of these conditions will give you a, a risk of PPH compared to population. I'm not going to bore you with all those statistics, but um, certain things antenatally, um, so things like if you're having a placental abruption, so if your placenta is rupturing off the wall of your uterus and you're actively bleeding, that's going to cause a risk for PPH afterwards. If you're known to have a placenta that is implanted in a problematic place, so a placenta previa, of course that's going to make you bleed. Um, if you've got a multiple pregnancy, so if you've got twins or, twi or, or triplets, because you've got a gravid uterus that is stretched much further than normal, after that uterus delivers, the chances are that it's going to relax quite significantly. So again, you can have a, uh, a problem with uterine tone. Any woman that's had a previous postpartum hemorrhage is, of course, more likely to follow suit again. Um, other problems, things like obesity, anemia, and the college guideline talks about Asian ethnicity. I don't know about the pathophysiology of Asian ethnicity causing you to have PPHs, um, but that is something they comment on within the guideline. Um, overall, the incidence in P of PPH in the UK is about 10%. So I'd say about 10% of deliveries um, uh, are complicated by PPH. And quite often, a lot of your intrapartum emergencies you would always anticipate a PPH. So again, when you're doing your obstetric training days or managing labor ward, anytime that you manage an emergency, so for example, shoulder dystocia or an instrumental delivery or an emergency cesarean section, until the case is concluded, until the placenta is delivered and the woman is settled, you've always got to anticipate the PPH. So again, um, things like emergency C-sections, inductions of labor, retained placenta, prolonged labors so if women are laboring forever if you're augmenting them with syntocin on which we'll cover later you know if you've got a uh, a uterus that has been asked to work and work and work for a very long time when it finally finishes its work and delivers that baby the possibility is that it's just going to relax back and go oh, thank god for that i'm exhausted and actually that's when you need to contract down and try and you know reduce the risk um again things like big babies um, so again, if you've got a uterus that's been stretched by an enormous baby, that's more likely to, to relax. Um, things like pyrexia and infection in labor because it's an inflammatory state can cause PPH. And again, maternal age, um, we always uh, say in obstetrics that uh, a maternal age of 40 or higher carries a lot of higher risks in terms of chromosomal abnormalities, higher risk of uh, hypertensive disorders, much higher risks related to comorbidities, higher risks of stillbirths. Um, so um, advanced maternal age is just one which is associated with higher complication rates in, in obstetrics. It's something to be mindful of. So in terms of how you minimize the risk of PPH for all women, um, when we talk about, excuse me for one second, when we talk about managing labor, um, I'm not going to teach you to suck eggs, I'm not going to, to insult your intelligence, but labor is split into the first, second and third stage. So first stage of labor is when women are uh, actively laboring between four and 10 centimeters. The second stage of labor is when they're fully dilated. The third stage of labor relate, re relates to delivery of the placenta and membranes. So a woman can choose either what we call active management of the third stage of labor, which is where we administer drugs to help um, to encourage placental separation, or a physiological third stage, which is where we just allow nature to uh, separate the, the, the placenta naturally, um, which can also be a risk factor. So active management of the third stage reduces the risk of PPH for all women. That just makes sense because you're, you're, you're giving medication to try and reduce that bleeding risk. That's got to be counted or, or weighed up against the, you know, the, the, the benefits to baby of things like delayed cord clamping. So delayed cord clamping is where you deliver your baby, you leave them with mum, you leave the placenta in situ, you leave the cord unclamped and pulsating because that allows transfer of placental blood to the baby, which gives better birth weights. It increases the amount of, uh, of, of neonatal hemoglobin, so can improve 
um, you know, baby's initial outcome following delivery, slightly increases the rates of neonatal jaundice due to a, due to a, a, a higher hemoglobin load, but overall delayed cord clamping is seen as being very good for babies. However, um, you can't wait forever if a woman is bleeding. Overall, the management of the third stage is patient choice. Most women do opt for active management of the third stage, um, but it all depends on, on women's attitudes, their lifestyles, their uh, desires for intervention. You know, management of, uh, of patient choice and obstetrics is probably a conversation that I could speak about for a week and a day. So, you know, <laughs> stay tuned for that. Um, when we're talking about what we would use to actively manage the third stage. Um, the first line medications are things like oxytocin, um, which is um, administered in the form of syntocinon. So it's just the man-made version of what the body makes itself um, to encourage a uterine contraction. So 10 units IM for women who don't have pre-existing risk factors for bleeding. The other option that we use is a drug called Sintometrin, which is oxytocin plus ergometrin, which reduces, which in the, in the data from the college guideline, uh, reduces the risk of women having minor PPHs. So it's the drug of choice for women who you know have risk factors. Quite often, a lot of units, and the, way, the, the, the unit I currently work in, uh, we use Sintometrin as the drug of choice. All women have Sintometrin if they're opting for active management at the third stage. Um, the only time that we would use Sintometrin with caution is that um, if women have a background of raised blood pressure, either antenatally or, or intrapartum, um, Sintometrin can send their blood pressure sky high, so we don't use it, we would resort to oxytocin. Um, the guideline does talk about how you can combine these different measures um, to, to lower the overall risk, so you can give um, you know, boluses of Sintometrin, you can use things like uh, tranexamic acid, which is a, a non-hormonal uh, method of controlling uh, blood loss, and then you can also use a continuous infusion of um, of oxytocin, which is um, uh, diluted in 500 mils of saline. It runs over four hours and gives you longer term contraction of the uterus. And again, that can help to reduce the risk of, of ongoing blood loss. Um, so what we're going to talk about now is your initial approach to managing uh, an atonic PPH. As we mentioned, 90% of PPHs are atonic. Um, and so this is how we go about managing them day to day on the labor ward. So either you might be in the room, um, because if you are, you know, your junior grade, you might be uh, observing your your senior carrying out an instrumental delivery, or you know, you might be a, a junior registrar who is uh, carrying out instrumental deliveries under supervision, or you might be sat in the office having a lovely cup of tea, um, you know, reading your emails, scrolling through you know Instagram or TikTok or whatever um, young people do nowadays, um, and the emergency buzzer goes off, and you go blimey and. The thing is, in obstetrics, emergency buzzers go off all the time. Um, and what is important then, as I've said at the very highlight, uh, at the very start of the talk, communication. Because until you go into the room, you don't know what that emergency is. And what you need is the staff who are there immediately to communicate what's going on in a concise manner. So, you know, emergency buzzer, you go running into the room and the midwife says, PPH, she's lost this much. You know, she's either just delivered, uh, placenta's out, or she's just delivered placenta still in situ, you know, we've done an episiotomy or all this sort of stuff. So on arrival, whilst you kind of automatically focus down into the, you know, the poor woman's external genitalia, because that's probably the source of the problem, you've got to have an initial ABCDE assessment. You know, that's every, every arm of medicine uses ABCDE. Um, so say hello to the woman, you know, introduce yourself. And it's an emergency, so you've got to do all this quickly. You know, but I always go in and say, hi, I'm Will, I'm the obstetrician on call, it's nice to meet you. We're just gonna try and sort this problem out. Um, and hopefully they'll either, you know, say, that's great, they'll give you a thumbs up. Um, but, you know, you can check if their airway is patent. You will, you know, when you pull the emergency buzzer, everyone goes in, literally everyone in the whole unit is in there. So you will have people that you can ask, can you do a set of OBS? Can you put up high flow oxygen? Can we do a blood pressure? Um, all that can be going on whilst you're carrying out your assessment. As I said, if you're the junior grade, make sure there's IV access in place. And if you're the registrar, make sure that someone's doing it. Um, if someone is bleeding, when you're getting IV access, make sure you send bloods. So full blood count, group and save, um, consider a cross match. 
um, check the maternal OBS. And then the first port of call is bimanual compression, which is what we're looking at on the left-hand side here in this picture. Obstetrics is not a glamorous specialty. It doesn't involve, you know, it's not orthopedics where you're doing beautiful fine surgery and, and you know, beautiful skin closure. It's not plastics where you're using tiny little sutures. It's, it's quite barbaric, to be honest, in, in, in some situations. And a bimanual compression is a closed fist inside the poor woman's vagina with your hand on the abdomen and you're essentially trying to fold the uterus over your fist to manually compress the um the uterus and obviously if a woman's got a really dense epidural in place that's fantastic because she won't feel any of that if you've had a woman that's had a normal delivery with minimal analgesia that's going to be really painful um, and again that's about communication ensuring that woman has adequate analgesia give that poor woman some gas and air to breathe on whilst you're doing all of this um empty the bladder so what any woman that's having an active bleed <clears throat> you're going to monitor the kidney function by the urine output so normally pass an indwelling catheter and make sure it stays in there attach a urometer if you've had a woman that's not really passed much urine in labor and she's got a really full bladder it's got 500 600 mils in there sometimes you know this this at the front here this is the the urinary bladder if that's full of urine, sometimes that can be pre preventing the uterus from contracting down. So by emptying the bladder, it can facilitate uterine contractions. Um, and then as you are doing all of that, you can actively assess the uterine tone with your uppermost hand because you can feel whether or not that uterus is contracting between your two hands. Um, and you then start shouting for uterotonics to be given. So either, you know, you, you will need to know what's been given already and what you've got room to give. So if you've got a woman with no blood pressure problems, you can have all of these different drugs. And we'll talk about these in terms of the MOH protocol. Um, if you have a woman that's got blood pressure problems, then you are limited to things like oxytocin and tranexamic acid. And then we also think about fluid resuscitation. So um, you need to think about you know as we said this IV access and being able to push in fluids quickly so it's normally you know initially two liters of of crystalloid so nice clear fluids either saline or Hartman's or something like that <clears throat> the use of colloids so things like gelispan um, has kind of fallen out of fashion in terms of active fluid resuscitation but it is still mentioned in the Royal College guideline that you can use uh, colloids to try and expand the circulating volume but all of this is kind of used as a bridging method because the best way to resuscitate a woman who is bleeding is by giving her some blood back um, the useful thing in obstetrics is the vast majority of your patients are fit healthy and young and they can tolerate blood loss but the other thing about that is that they will tolerate and tolerate and tolerate until all of a sudden they don't and they can drop off a, qu a cliff very very quickly which is why you need to get ahead of that bleeding quite quickly um, so this is all things that you can do within the room. So this is within your labor ward room. You can manage an atonic PPH. And sometimes you just get called in. She's had a, a brisk bleed of 700, 800 mils. You administer a second dose of oxytocin or symptometrin. You start an, an oxytocin infusion and everything settles. You put a catheter into the bladder and you can walk away. That's all marvelous. What happens if the bleeding doesn't stop? So either you've got a placenta that's still in situ that's not showing any signs of separating and a woman's bleeding. You've gone through all of these things and either things aren't improving but or they're improving but the bleeding's still not settled. You've then got to think about transfer to the operating theatre. Now if all of these things are happening within an operating theatre, so you've just done an instrumental delivery or you're doing a cesarean section, then you're in the right place. But if you're in the labour ward room, you've got to have a, a threshold as to when you would take a woman to theatre. My personal threshold, and I think a lot of, um, of middle grade thresholds, is if you've got a woman who is uh, about a thousand mils and the bleeding is ongoing, then you've got to think about transfer to theatre because transfer to theatre isn't always immediate. And especially if they're bleeding heavily, by the time you've thought about it, spoken to someone about it, turned your back, looked again, she's lost another 500 mils. So if you're thinking about theatre, vocalise that early and, and get going. And sometimes that transfer to theatre is with you as the obstetrician sat on the bed, 
doing by manual compression. And again, you've got to have a thought about the dignity and the privacy of the woman that you're looking after. So don't wheel the poor thing, start naked on the bed with no covering. If you're taking her to theatre and you're doing by manual compression, before you leave that room, just make sure that someone covers her with a sheet because it's not dignified being wheeled to theatre in that state. So then we talk about surgical uh, methods of managing the PPH. So um, going from left to right is kind of the uh, surgical options from kind of less invasive to most invasive. So initially from down below, so in theatre, in the thotomy, uh, visualising the cervix, we can insert uh, what's called an intra intrauterine balloon tamponade. So most common ones are what's called the ruche balloon or the bakri balloon. Um, so I think that's a bakri balloon at the top. Um, that's used in a lot of um, in some of the Western European countries. In the bottom is, it's called a condom catheter. So you've got a simple Foley's catheter and you've got a latex condom on the top. So you, you, you put your latex condom over the top of your uh, Foley's catheter. Uh, you fill the condom full of water um, once it's sat inside the uterus. And that's used in uh, countries where uh, you don't have access to expensive medical products. So things like Sub-Saharan Africa, um, you can use condom catheters. Now, the thing is, is that a, uh, a battery balloon costs about £250 a pop, I think. They're not cheap to use. Um, so that's why in developing countries, uh, a simple latex condom and a Foley's catheter is far cheaper. So the way in which a, a battery balloon works, you've got a, a, a a drainage channel and a filling channel. So you've got a drainage a drainage channel, channel at the tip, which is just similar to a Foley's catheter, it's just a, a hollow lumen. And then you've got this uh, water-filled balloon. So it comes empty, you pass it through the cervix, um, and it sits inside the uterine cavity, and then you fill it up with water. And you know, you normally, you're gonna need a good 500, 600 mils of water. And what that does is it expands and pushes against the endometrium and the myometrium from the inside, and then you're giving your uterotonic drugs from the outside and essentially it's squeezing the uterus between those two things and providing compression from both inside and outside. Um, you can then also monitor the ongoing blood loss through the drainage channel. So you, you connect a, a drainage bag to the end of that and you can see if there's ongoing blood loss through there. And that happens exactly the same for the condom catheter. Um, so if that manages to get on top of the bleeding, that's fantastic. If not, then you're thinking about other surgical methods of control of bleeding. So this is what we call the B. Lynch uh, uterine brace suture. Um, I have never done one of these and I hope never to have to need to want to do one of these because the vast majority of things settle the step before with your pharmaceutical management. So if you are midway through a cesarean section, you've already got the abdomen open. Marvellous. This is what you do. If you have tried your, uh, you know, if you've done a vaginal delivery, and you've tried your intrauterine balloon, it's not working, then you think about your brace suture. So you'd have to create a laparotomy. So you'd have to do a, a, a transverse incision like you would for a C-section. Get down to the uterus, you have to open the lower segment, you pass your stitch in, and then bring it out over the top, loop it round the back, pass it through posteriorly, as you can see here, and then uh, back over the top, down and out and then you tie it across so that you kind of create a lovely pair of braces for your uterus and, and, and squash it down. Um, and then over here is um, what's called uterine artery ligation. So we've got uterine arteries coming in from, as we said, the branch of the internal iliac. You find where it is running up the side of the uterus and you pass a suture around it on either side to tie them off and to reduce the blood flow. Now these are dissolvable stitches, so they will dissolve in time. So it's just about reducing your blood loss temporarily. Again, I've not, I've, I've not even had to get to here. I hope never have to get to here. These are advanced surgical methods that you would not be embarking on as anything other than uh, an experienced consultant. And then the final surgical management of a postpartum hemorrhage, if you've tried all of these, and then you've tried all of these again, and the woman is continuing to bleed, then the only other option to consider is uh, a peripartum hysterectomy. So removal of the entire uterus, which obviously means that you uh, would no longer be able to have children naturally. Um, it's a very difficult procedure. 
um, because your term uterus has got huge caliber blood vessels, the anatomy is all distorted. It is normally something that needs to be a decision by two consultants who are in agreement that this is the right course of action to, to, to take. Um, when you are taking a woman to theater for surgical management of a PPH, you do always need to mention the possibility of a hysterectomy because sometimes you start these procedures on spinal anesthetic, but if you're embarking onto a hysterectomy, then you are going to be anesthetizing that woman under general anesthetic and you want to make sure that she's going to be aware that she might wake up without a uterus. And again, I have only seen one peripartum hysterectomy um, and that was due to a woman who was known to have a bleeding risk because she had a placenta accreta, which was, you know, is where a placenta invades all the way through the wall of the uterus and ended up in her bladder. Um, and it was just one of those ones where there was no way that you could safely manage to get that placenta out uh, without her bleeding to death, other than removing her uterus at the same time. Um, so this slide is just an example of the uh, PPH documentation sh uh, sheet that we use in the trust that I currently work in. So um, the, during uh, a massive obstetric hemorrhage, the scribe is one of the most useful people in the world. Um, and you need to have someone who is going to be able to accurately document who's there, what's going on, what time have you made your interventions? What time have you given your bloods? Um, what time are you thinking about going to theatre? You know, it, it, it's a really helpful aid memoir because sometimes the scribe can say, like, oh, have you given second symptometrin? Have you started giving hemabate, um, which is carboprost? You know, have you given it at the right time? You know, because 15 minutes has elapsed. And I'll cover later on uh, in a summary slide the kind of uh, the, the drugs that we give, how they act and what the doses are and the intervals and all that sort of stuff. So, um, Every unit that you work in should have a PPH management pathway and a PPH management scribing sheet. Um, and again, this is a flow chart from our local guideline, which is adapted from the college guideline, um, which is talking about major hemorrhage. Um, so blood loss greater than a thousand um, and, 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 and how we follow that. And essentially, it's just a summary of all the things that we have talked about um, just now. Um, so all of your medical therapies, your ABCD assessment, uh, and your uh, thresholds for taking a woman through to theatre. Uh, I'm just mindful of time. I know that I'm waffling on forever. Um, so talking about fluids and blood products, this uh, table here on the left is taken from the college guideline in terms of, uh, of what we give and when. Um, on the right hand side, so the thera therapeutic goals for PPH management, you're constantly monitoring um, your uh, your your um, your lab work and sometimes point of care testing like HemoQ. So we're aiming to try and have a hemoglobin above 80, platelets greater than 50. Your clotting factors are, you hope that you've got an anaesthetist that's gonna manage all of those because you're busy trying to sort out the bottom end. Um, so normally if you're having a major, a major hemorrhage, you're giving blood and fresh frozen plasma in a one-to-one -one ratio. Um, and then you're thinking about things like uh, platelets and cryoprecipitate if you've got uh, low platelets or, 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 or high fibrinogen. The other thing that the guideline does talk about is the thought about cell salvage. So if you work in a big enough hospital where you've got ready access to cell salvage and they can break out in an emergency, that's fantastic. If you've got, uh, say, for example, an elective procedure where you've got a patient who's either a high bleeding risk or known to refuse blood products, so say, for example, Jehovah's Witnesses, pre-booking cell salvage for that can be really, really helpful. Um, a brief thing to talk about is human factors related to obstetric emergencies. Um, with obstetrics and management of labor ward, it is a multidisciplinary team. It's you as the obstetricians, it's the midwives, it's your shift leaders, it's your healthcare assistants who might be running off to get bloods, it's your anaesthetist, it's your theater team. There is so many people that is involved in managing an emergency and communication is something that often is the root cause for a lot of, of problems. Um, We'll talk through some case studies shortly, um, and and we can we can talk about some of my personal um, uh, experiences with with human factors. Um, it's not just about communicating with staff; it's communicating with the patient. It's also about the birth partners, because quite often the the patient in front of you is kind of just dealing with it, and they might be kind of zoned out. They might be kind of disassociating from it. The the partner, whether that be the the the, you know, the, the romantic partner, the um, 
be mum, father, sister-in-law, anyone who's in that room can be traumatized by, by these events. And actually communicating and debriefing with them is also really important. Um, as we mentioned, a scribe is really important. Um, someone also needs to maintain that kind of one step back, that helicopter view. And it tends to be the more senior people. And that's one of the reasons why I quite like, uh, quite like, but one, one of my preferences is to perform by manual compression because that's one job that you can do whilst thinking about all the other steps. If you've got, you know, if you, if you enter a room and someone's already doing by manual compression, then one of the things that you can do is just take a step back and monitor the situation and actively uh, manage everyone else. Um, if you're the junior grade in the room, IV access, that's all you need to do. Um, the other thing is escalate, escalate early and escalate high. So if you are the junior, you call your middle grade, so your registrar. If you're the registrar, call your boss. If, you're, if you've got bleeding, especially if you're thinking about theater, whether it's daytime or nighttime, it doesn't matter pick up the phone, call for help, because you're going to want it sooner than you think. Um, when you come to the end of your case, it's always about the, the Ds. So you've got to think about what you do after everything finishes. So document. So you've got to write your management of events. And that's why the scribe is so key, because you've got to be able to show that you've managed everything in a stepwise manner at the right time. Uh, debriefing, so that's patient, that's birth partners, that's staff, that's a verbal and potentially written discussion as to what you've done, why, the implications, the long-term outcomes. Uh, day ticking or whatever kind of risk management reporting software that you have, like any blood loss over, the, over 1,500 mils is uh, an obstetric incident that needs to be reported and investigated. The other ones of donuts and drinks are entirely optional, but you need to have some self-care after any form of emergency. Um, so these are things that you need to look after yourself with. Um, a brief talk on secondary PPH. So these are the PPHs after 24 hours and up to six weeks afterwards. The initial management remains the same. So with A, B, C, D. And these are tend to be women that are coming in from home saying, oh, I had a normal vaginal delivery three weeks ago. I'm now bleeding. I'm in pain. I don't feel very well. So quite often we'll need to do an, exa an abdominal examination, a speculum examination. We'll assess the genital tract microbiology with a high vaginal swab, potentially an endocervical swab. Quite often we treat with empirical antibiotics to, to treat for infection with the lining of the wound called endometritis. Um, and we also consider using a pelvic ultrasound to try and look for retained products of conception. So say, for example, a, a small piece of uterus, a uh, uterus, a small piece of placenta that might remain in situ or some blood clots or what have you. Sometimes with postpartum ultrasound scan, it's quite a difficult one because if you scan a woman within the first few days of delivery, you're always going to see something inside that uterus. You're always going to see some blood clots. It's how much you're going to act on that. Because if you take a woman back to the operating theatre postnatally for a surgical evacuation, which is where you pass a, a suction tube through the cervix into the uterus, there is a risk of, of perforating the uterus. The risk of perforating a non-pregnant uterus is about one in a thousand, and that goes up uh, sixfold to six in a thousand in the immediate postnatal period. And you're sure the absolute numbers of six in a thousand aren't that high, but when you say it's a sixfold increase, that's actually something that you don't really want to undertake too readily. Um, and that risk can be higher if a woman is breastfeeding. So that's a bit of a, a batter through. Um, and we're going to do a few case studies now um, and talk about some of the potential presenting features of some of these PPHs. Um, these are all patients that I have actually uh, managed within the last month. Um, so these are common common, common obstetric presentation. So we've got Mrs. A, 36-year-old lady, 36 lady. She's a para three. She's had three normal deliveries. She's got a raised BMI. She's got twins on board. She's being induced at 37 weeks. She's needed a lot of uh, induction agents to start her in labor. She's then been augmented with syntocinon. She's got an epidural in situ. She's needed to have assisted deliveries for both of her twins. The first one needed to have an episiotomy to help make room to get them out. You've delivered the placenta and now you've got brisk bleeding. 
and just take a moment to have a consideration of what you might be thinking about in terms of your uh, underlying cause. You'd hope by now that this woman's got IV access. You'd hope at some stage in this labor, you'd have, even before she had come to hospital, I'd hope she's got IV access on board. Um, this woman's poor uterus is like a deflated hot air balloon. She's having an atonic PPH. She has had a uterus that's been stretched for weeks and weeks and weeks. It's already had three pregnancies and deliveries, so it's tired. You know, it's labored for hours on syntocinon, and now she's also had an assisted delivery. So the second stage has been accelerated, and that uterus just doesn't know what's hit it. So you're going to manage her with an ABCD approach. You're going to give her those uterotonics. You assess that episiotomy. You've done it correctly. You've done it at the right angle. It's not bleeding too much, but it can be a source of trauma. So you need to make sure that you close that. Uh, you're actively managing her blood loss. You're asking the staff to weigh it at the end of the at the end of the closure. You're happy that you're keeping on top of it. You are um, not concerned with her vital signs. So the outcome is that she has an 800 mil blood loss. The bleeding settles, and you just say, "Well, we need to do a full blood count six hours postnatally to make sure that she doesn't require any transfusion and she may need some iron." This is B. A 19-year-old primate. She's being induced at 38 weeks for pelvic girdle pain, mat request, pelvic pain. She gets augmented with syntocinon. She has an epidural. Uh, she has rapid progress, fully dilated. And she has a kiwi delivery due to fetal dist distress and maternal exhaustion. You carry out an episiotomy and she's got a very vascular perineum uh, with very uh, bleedy vessels. It looks like little fountain jets are, are coming out of that perineum and she's bleeding actively very, very quickly. Um, so the cause of that PPH is trauma. Uh, you make sure that your uterine tone is adequate, but you're pretty sure that's going to be the case. You try and get that trauma closed as soon as possible. You make sure she's got IV access, you give her fluids, you take bloods. You consider and you would give tranexamic acid because tranexamic acid is going to help to reduce that blood loss because it's not a tone issue. Um, and you consider uh, transfer to theatre. Um, for this lady, you think, oh, the blood loss was only about 800 mils. That's a fine. You walk out of the room to do your documentation. The midwife comes out. She says, well, I've weighed all of that. It's about 1,700 mils there. And you go, oh, crumbs. So she's lost a lot. She needs to have uh, high dependency obs. So she needs to have half hourly obs. She's had an indwelling catheter with a urometer cross matcher for two units um, and actually fortunately her postnatal hemoglobin is only 107 which is not a significant drop and she's systemically well. Um, final case study Mrs C a 39 year old patient para 2 two previous normal deliveries she's an induction of labor after her, uh, her membranes have ruptured she stays at one centimeter for quite some time um, despite augmenting her labor you then get an emergency buzzer because the midwife thinks she's having a seizure because she goes suddenly very, very rigid. Uh, you do your ABCD assessment and you actually realize that she's gone from one centimeter to fully, fully dilated in about 10 minutes. And that would probably make me go a bit rigid and a bit upset. Um, the baby has also not really enjoyed that sudden process of coming rocketing through the pelvis and it's having a fetal bradycardia. So the heart rate's dropped, it's not recovering. So you need to expedite that delivery as soon as possible. So you do a rapid forceps delivery in the room. You think, brilliant, I've done a really good job. I've saved that baby. And you can think about closing the episiotomy and making yourself a cup of tea. However, the placenta's in situ and she's bleeding. She's lost about 800 mils. And you think, okay, we need to think about going to theater. So when she hits about a thousand mils loss, you then take her to the operating theater. Um, you have a chat with your anesthetic colleague about general anesthetic versus spinal. We opt for a spinal and she has further 500 mils of blood loss. So we activate the major obstetric hemorrhage protocol. Get that placenta out as soon as possible. Uh, however, we give her uterotonics, we close the episiotomy, and yet she's just pouring blood. Pouring, pouring, it's like a tap that's been turned on and will not stop. There's also no evidence that any of this blood is clotting together. Um, it is just watery, it's like dilute squash. You try putting a battery balloon in, that's still not doing it. Your uh, haemoglobin in the middle of theatre, she's got platelets, the platelets of 17 and a haemoglobin of 55. She has 
an underlying clotting disorder and and the only way that you're going to make her feel better and to arrest this pph is to give her clotting factors back um, and everything else is just about actively resuscitating the patient whilst you're waiting for blood products from the uh, from the lab um, so she has a seven liter blood loss she requires multiple blood products she is considered for escalation to intensive care however she's settled enough that she can be on high dependency um, the battery balloon is kept in for 24 hours and the patient made a full recovery um, so we're coming to the end i'm really sorry that we're not getting much time for, for questions but i am happy to, to stay a little bit longer if everyone else is willing to stay pph is a common obstetric emergency we said about 10 percent of pregnancies can be complicated by pph there are multiple risk factors but it can occur in the absence of any risk factors whatsoever as we discussed worldwide hemorrhage can and often is fatal and it can still be fatal in this country if not managed appropriately we have to manage it with an mdt approach for junior colleagues make sure that you've got IV access that's the only thing i want you to do and everything else you can just be helpful and um, manage an abcd approach remember and treat your four t's maintain your channels of communication consider your human factors escalate 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 and always remember to document debrief and datex in terms of the drugs that we use in a pph on the left is the medications that you use um, the doses and the uh, mode of action. I won't go on at length about all of these different things. Um, I understand these slides are gonna be uploaded to a platform where you can review that at a later date. Um, apologize to your midwife, because you are going to give a lot of medications that encourage smooth muscle contraction, because all of the uterotonics encourage smooth muscle contraction, because that's all the uterus is. Unfortunately, the other thing that is a smooth muscle in that region is the bowel. And it's very, very common for a lot of these uterotonics to cause quite profuse diarrhea. So the poor woman, and you apologize to her too, the poor woman is going to have quite a turbulent time with her bowels during this post-operative period. Um, and especially if she has had a spinal or an epidural and she's not been particularly mobile, it's going to unfortunately involve quite a lot of changing of pads and sheets, um, but it is a, a necessary evil. Um, and that's me with two minutes to spare. I hope that's been helpful for everyone. Um, I hope that um, that it's it's been informative and I welcome any questions. Oh, thank you so much, Will. That was really fascinating. I really enjoyed the talk. I was just glued through the whole thing. Um, we just have a couple of people who are asking about, um, so they've got, um, so I think someone is in an ambulance service and other persons in the community, and they've said that they have mesoprostol, mm. uh, sublingual or rectal as a first attack pre-hospital. Yes. Um, they're asking if that's also used in hospital. So yeah, as going back to that slide, mesoprostol we do use in hospital as a, as a kind of third line drug. Um, the only reason being that in 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 the ambulance service and in um, sort of developing countries, the reason why mesoprostol is useful is that it doesn't need to be stored in a fridge. So that's why it can be used by crews, um, our, colleague, our colleagues in the ambulance service. Whereas uh, things like syntocinon, ergometrin, syntometrin, uh, carboprost, they have to be stored in a fridge. So there's a there's sort of practicalities around it that, that can that can be difficult. Um, so that's why they're first line. The reason why they're not first line in 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 the secondary uh, setting is that the mode of action for mesoprostol it only reaches peak activity anywhere between 30 and 180 minutes. So there's a bit of a delay in it in it kicking in. So it tends to be for us in hospital we give it at the end of a case once you're happy that everything is settling, but more as a kind of this will help over the next few hours to keep minimizing the blood loss. Mm. Thank you. Um, another question um, is, and I think Rinku has answered it, but is the Bakri balloon used only for atonic causes of bleeds or can it used, be used for other reasons as well? So we mentioned the um, uh, clotting issue. Yeah, it, it, 
it, it is mainly used for atonic PPHs. Um, it can be used as a step to kind of help to reduce the blood loss in, uh, in, a, in, a, in a clotting disorder. However, the only way that you're going to arrest bleeding secondary to a clotting disorder is replacing the clotting factors. Um, mm -hmm. So yes, it is mainly used for atonic PPHs. A traumatic PPH, you know, if you've got you know really bad vaginal trauma, putting a battery balloon is is not really going to help. And you can't put mm. the only thing that you could do to help with vaginal trauma is following closure is put a, a ribbon gauze pack into the vagina. And mm -hmm. that's sometimes something that we use um, is that you will pack the vagina with uh, with ribbon gauze, as much ribbon gauze as you can put in there to put local pressure against the against the walls of the vagina. Unfortunately, with that, again, it's really uncomfortable. Um, so you want to try and get that removed as soon as possible. Mm. Um, I think that's it for questions. So thank you. Honestly, thank you so much. I think it was really fascinating talk. Thank you. No, you're very welcome. And thank you everyone for attending. Okay. I'm going to um, switch off the live feed now. Thank okay. you so much, Will. Lovely to meet you. No problem. Thank you.